Welcome to the Real Estate Espresso Podcast, your morning shot of what's new in the world of real estate investing. I'm your host, Victor Menashe. Happy first of the month. Happy Canada Day for our listeners in Canada. On the first day of each month, we review the book of the month. In order to be considered for a book of the month, a book has to meet a very simple criteria. It has to either change your life or your perspective on the world. And whether it does or not, of course, is up to you. If you consume it as a piece of entertainment, you're missing the point. But if you internalize it, make the book's message part of you, you have an opportunity for real lasting change. Our book this month is absolutely worthy of book of the month. Our book this month is called Fed Up by Danielle DiMartino Booth. Danielle worked at the Federal Reserve Bank of Dallas for nine years, where she ascended into the inner sanctum of those tasked with crafting Fed policy. Last month, we reviewed Ben Bernanke's book called 21st Century Monetary Policy. The contrast between these two books that deal roughly with the same historic time frame is dramatic. It was clear when I read Ben Bernanke's book, there was some revision of history at play to better match Mr. Bernanke's narrative. Some of those revisions were laid bare in Danielle's book. As investors, Fed policy seems to play an extraordinary and large role in what happens to asset prices. We owe it to ourselves to be well-educated on this system where 12 unelected officials wield more financial influence than almost any elected official anywhere in the world, with the possible exception of the President of the United States. Our central banks are using the printing press like never before. Expanding the money supply is a technique that works, at least until it doesn't, and the default that occurs happens slowly at first and then all of a sudden. It's something we need to be concerned about. Understanding the Fed and how it functions from these two different perspectives is like watching both sides of a coin before deciding which elements from both sides of the coin seem more credible. Danielle shared her personal journey starting on Wall Street and then becoming a financial reporter and eventually being hired into the Federal Reserve Bank of Dallas. She describes the legions of economists who seem to operate in an academic vacuum. They're often more concerned with getting their research published in academic journals as opposed to figuring out how to benefit the economy. She describes the efforts to bring more transparency to how the Fed works. One big change was to release lightly edited but otherwise theoretically complete transcripts of every FOMC meeting with a delay of five years. But the fact that this was going to be put on paper for history to judge changed the way the meetings operated. Previously, the meetings had been largely unscripted exchanges. But then members started receiving preliminary drafts of transcripts. They discovered that everyone began reading scripted comments. Meetings were no longer arenas with which to debate and influence fellow members. All persuasion had to be done ahead of time behind closed doors, and that concentrated power even more solidly in the hands of the chairman, who could visit individually with governors before the meetings. In the book, Danielle outlines how she brought current alternative data sources into the inner sanctum of the Fed, much to the objection and consternation of the economists, who claimed that the data wasn't seasonally adjusted. It didn't have the rigor that was necessary to be academically approved. But seasonally adjusted data is delayed by months. It's far too late to have any use when real-time decision-making is required. One place where Ben Bernanke and Danielle agree is that the Fed derives most of its decision-making from financial models. The economists spend the majority of their time with their heads down, focused on their models of the economy. The decision-making is very model-centric. But if the economic conditions are not described by the model, you can imagine what happens. There are so many things in the economy that are simply not model. Like, for example, what is the impact of lowering interest rates as compared with the tightening of lending criteria? These economic models don't really model the difficulty in getting a loan. It's as if the cost of money is the most important thing. Now, as real estate investors, we know all too well that the interest rate is not the most important metric when evaluating a loan. The loan terms are actually more important, but Fed policy affects the money supply to the government and the banks, not the population directly. These errors in the financial models will eventually appear, but only in hindsight. Here's another example. The Fed didn't expect newly printed money that was intended for the U.S. economy in 2010 to be loaned by banks to countries outside the U.S. Why is it so much U.S. cash was appearing in China? From her vantage point inside the Fed, she witnessed numerous forms of wrongdoing leaking information about monetary policy from which profits could be made. That's akin to insider trading, perhaps even worse. And some of these transgressions appear to have happened at nearly the highest levels in the organization. The dysfunction within the Fed itself was frankly shocking, and in other ways not that surprising. It's a culture of elitism that emanates from the most prestigious universities. 
the hiring of economists is highly concentrated from a small group of schools having a very consistent and narrow perspective on the economic world order. It's no wonder that Keynesian monetary and fiscal models permeate our government. Janet Yellen, who completely missed all of the signs of the 2008 financial crisis when she was at the San Francisco Fed, went on to become Fed chairman. The cheerleader for fiscal stimulus as the solution continued the hits of heroin into the economy long after the crisis of over. And now she's Treasury Secretary. She's simply spending more money, but from the other side of the table. See, when bubbles burst, it's tempting to blame the pin for bursting the bubble. But it's not the pin's fault. In fact, it's never the pin's fault. As you think about that, go out and get a copy of Daniel DiMartino Booth's book called Fed Up. As you think about that, have an awesome rest of your day. Go make some great things happen. We'll talk to you again tomorrow.